Good morning. It's so good to have each and every one of you here with us this morning as we continue our study in the book of Colossians this morning. If you've got your Bible handy, you could open your Bible to Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, well, where we will begin this morning. As always, we want to begin with a word of prayer. I would invite you as, as I lift up my prayers, I lead you in prayer, that you go ahead and voice your concerns to God, that you specifically speak the names of the people that you're asking God to help, uh, to ask God for the help that, that you are desiring. God is able to do all things, and he is with you where you are today, just like he is here with me this morning in the place where I am. Go ahead and, and lift up your prayers as we pray. Father, we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for this Sunday morning that, that you've given us, Lord, to serve you for another day. Lord, we come here this morning seeking you. We, we ask, Lord, for your advice and your guidance and your teaching as we go through your word. Lord, we have concerns in our hearts, each and every one of us do, for, for friends of ours and relatives who maybe don't know you as Lord and Savior, do not have an eternal security with you as yet. Uh, others, Lord, that may be uh, physically ill or psychologically ill or mentally ill or even emotionally ill, Lord, uh, we know you're able to provide all healing and that all healing comes from you. Lord, we lift those names up to you even now. You hear them as we speak those names to you, and we, we entrust those people that we love to your, your guiding hand and your healing hand. Lord, we, we pray for our nation. Lord, we pray for our leaders. Lord, we ask that they would come to a a saving knowledge of you so that you could guide their lives and lead them toward governing us according to your scriptural truths and your ways. Lord, guide us in all that we do. Guide our hearts this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we're going to be looking at, uh, at Colossians chapter 1, verse 24 through chapter 2. Two, verse three. The title of our our study today is the Gospel's Goal. We today live in a postmodern society. This is true worldwide. In the early nineteen fifties, morality, as found in the the Bible, began to be viewed as questionable and relative to one's own personal interpretation. Postmodernism is really just a sophisticated attempt by modern man to justify his or her immoral behavior and assuage his or her guilty conscience. Our postmodern society today embraces things that we see in the news every day, the cancel culture, where people don't like what we say, so they just want to cancel us out and, and not allow us to have a voice. There, with that, we see on our college campuses a, a repression of, of free speech, people who want to speak on a subject that so several do not agree with would want to keep that person away so they can't voice their opinion. We see a situational morality and ethics being implemented across our country. We see what is called fake news and in the internet, which really amounts to dishonest or deceptive sources of information that are trying to influence uh, people's minds and people's hearts. Colossians 1, 24 
through 27, we, we see a, a theme of being committed as believers in Jesus Christ, as messengers from God, people who come to our, our world and to our people and, and bring a message that comes directly from the throne of God. In verse 24, we, Paul writes, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, and filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. As we saw earlier in the book of Philippians, Paul found cause for rejoicing in the work of Christ's church amid his own personal sufferings for your sake. Since Paul had not personally, had not been personally involved in establishing the church at Colossae, who he's writing to now, the your in this sentence is likely a reference not to the specific congregation there at Colossae, but to the larger Gentile focus of Paul's missions ministry as he was taking the gospel into the world. We might understand these words to mean suffering for your gen you Gentiles. Okay, since Paul is largely at this time taking the gospel to Gentile countries. And this taking God's word to Gentile countries had created a great deal of antagonism on the part of some believers in Christ who had Jewish backgrounds. It was as a result of this antagonism from the Jews that Paul had been stoned almost to death in the Gentile region of Lystra. Though there were Jews there, they were raising a ruckus, and they were trying to snuff out Paul's word as he spoke and keep him silent on this good news about the Messiah who come into the world. Lystra was just a short distance from Colossae, as we see in Acts 14, 19 through 20. A couple of years later, Paul had been severely beaten by a large mob of Jews in Jerusalem. Then he was arrested. Then he was unjustly imprisoned. And he was sent to Rome for two or three more years after that. We saw that in Acts 21 through 28. The matter that invites serious attention in this text that we're looking at here in verse 24 is Paul's assertion that his physical suffering for the sake of the gospel amounted to his willingly given share on behalf of Christ's body, which is the church, filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Now, that's kind of an interesting choice of words. And so we, we kind of have to ask ourselves, we might observe that Paul's sufferings were for the sake of other people and not afflictions brought on by some quirky behavior on Paul's part. He was being polite and open and just speaking and sharing the truth about Jesus Christ. What then is meant where Paul said he was completing what was lacking in Christ's afflictions? What does he mean by that? Paul had just declared, if we look back at verse 20, just five verses above, four verses above, Paul had just declared that Christ had reconciled all things to himself, 
having made peace through the blood of the cross. Thusly, we can eliminate any idea that Paul meant his own sufferings had redeeming value for any person. These afflictions of Paul were for advancing the outreach of the gospel and growth of the church. Paul felt he had started late because of his time spent persecuting Christianity and thereby was lagging behind in his own sufferings in advance in advancing the gospel. Consequently, Paul rejoiced in opportunities to reduce, to reduce that deficit by his own suffering and on behalf of the body of Christ. Possibly, Paul recognized that not every genuinely redeemed individual was willing to suffer for the sake of spreading the gospel and growing the church. In that case, Paul was determined to do everything he could to erase that deficit, even to the point of risking his own life and his own freedom for the cause of the gospel. God has always known this great willingness of Saul of Tarsus, which is Paul's given Jewish name, to suffer for the cause of Christ. God had always known this, that this was God, this was Paul's heart, Saul's heart. In Acts 9, 15 through 16, when God had instructed Ananias to go to Saul at the time of his Damascus Road experience, God said to Ananias, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my sake. Now we come down to verses 25 through 27, where Paul writes, of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I may carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but now has been manifested in his saints, to whom God will to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, continuing to speak of his relationship to the church as a, as a corporate church of Christ, Paul called himself a minister. Okay, that's the translation in the New American Standard. The Christian Standard Bible translates that same word, that same Greek word as a servant. This was not an assignment or ministry that Paul took up on his own accord. Rather, it was part of God's plan or according to the stewardship given to him by God. That word stewardship is another word. It's translated a little bit differently in Christian Standard Bible, where it calls it the commission. Uh, this is God's commission specifically to the Apostle Paul. This made Paul's calling a sacred trust. In writing to the Ephesian church, Paul put it this way. Ephesians 3, 7, Paul writes, I was made a minister. There's that same word again, could be translated servant. I was made a minister or a servant according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working 
of his power. All understand understood his calling to fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. This calling had two aspects. Number one, by his ministry of traveling extensively throughout Asia Minor and even into Europe, preaching and writing, Paul displayed an essential role. He played a, an essential role in the geographical expansion of the gospel message making it known in a variety of places in Asia and in Europe. Number two, through his inspired writings, his letters, Paul had a special ministry of filling out the true meaning of the gospel and its application to life. God made and chose Paul as a human channel through whom to disclose the meaning of his special revelation in Christ Jesus. Now look at this. 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament, almost half of the books, open with Paul's name, with Paul as the author. Paul was gifted and motivated by God to become the great theologian of the new covenant in Christ Jesus. Now let's look at verse 26. What Paul had previously referred to in this text as the word of God, he now referred to as the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and human generations. The term mystery, often used in the New Testament, does not carry the common understanding of something shrouded in secrecy and difficult or impossible to understand or explain. The biblical meaning of this word translated mystery refers to something God has made known, but which people could not otherwise discover or figure out. It's a part of God's revelation to mankind. So under the new covenant in Jesus Christ, there is an an expanded revelation of God. I won't say a new revelation, but a, an expanded revelation that wasn't known by the world until Christ came. It was revealed more fully in Jesus Christ. What then is the truth that God previously kept hidden through all the past ages from people of all generations, but now has been manifested to his saints. Just what is this mystery that's been revealed under the new covenant? It was the gloriously rich provision that God made available in the fullness of time Namely, as Paul states it here in verse 27, Christ in you and me, the hope of glory. Our hope is in Jesus Christ alone. A longstanding provision of a relationship with God based on the on faithfulness to the old covenant law and the sacrificial system was henceforth to be superseded by the intimate and 
inward experience of the indwelling of Christ in the hearts of God's people by the presence of God's Holy Spirit who comes to live within us as we repent of our sinful ways and place our faith and our belief in the death of Jesus on the cross. With that, believing that that death of Jesus is the total price for our redemption from our sins, to buy us back to be God's people. So it's so important for us to understand this mystery that comes forward in the New Testament or the under the New Covenant. Galatians 4.19. Paul wrote to the church at Galatia, my children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. The, the, the church at Galatia was being misled by, by false teachers who were teaching a different gospel. And Paul was hurt and he was concerned about them, and he knew that what they needed was to be grown spiritually in their faith in, in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. In John 16, 13 through 14, Jesus had said to each one of his disciples on that fateful night when he told them that Tomorrow, he was going to be crucified and die. Right before they left that upper room that night and went to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus promised those disciples and every one of his disciples who would come after them, he said, but when he, the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit comes, he will guide you into all the truth. You know, when talking about the postmodern, the postmodern society that we live in, which doesn't want to know the truth. When the truth is being spoken, they want to silence the truth. Well, God, Jesus told us and promised us that through the Holy Spirit coming to take residence in every believer in Him, He will. The Holy Spirit will guide you and me into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, God the Father and God the Son telling. He will speak and he will disclose to you and to me what is to come, what we are about to face. And in that, God's Holy Spirit will glorify Christ for Christ will take of God's and will disclose it to you and I and every other believer in Jesus Christ. God will show us the truth and he'll show us the ways we should go and he'll give us the words to say. Being a Christian and being gloriously saved and transformed by God is a matter of having Christ living in you and in me on our journey toward heaven and with that, our great hope in glory. Powerful words. Powerful words that, that guide our lives. No longer are we fearing death? But we are actually looking forward to living forever in peace and in the glorious presence of God in heaven. And I said, here an amen there. I know if you were here with me, you're probably saying amen right there in your living room at this very moment. Now let's come down to verses 28 and 29. As we as believers receive the Holy Spirit and we grow spiritually in our faith in Jesus Christ, 
We need to be focused on helping with the maturity of the new believers who are coming to Christ each and every day. Verse 28, we proclaim him, Jesus Christ, admonishing every man and teaching every man. It says man, but it means men and women, every person admonishing every person and teaching every person with all wisdom so that we may present every person complete in Christ. For this purpose, Paul says, I also labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works in me and also works in you and I through God's Spirit. Paul's declaration that we proclaim Christ has a condensed way of summarizing the image of the gospel proclaimed by every believer in Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus is the focal point of our preaching and our teaching whether we are evangelizing the lost or we are seeking to mature those who are already saved. Christ Jesus is always our focal point of our teaching and our preaching in the church and out in the community. Verse 28, look at that. The tenor of our preaching and teaching is that of admonishing, as it's translated in the New American Standard, or the warning, as, as is translated in the Christian Standard Bible. There's admonishing or warning and teaching that is going on from each and every one of us. And every time we encounter a person who doesn't know Jesus Christ and a person who does know Jesus Christ, there is always in this process of teaching and preaching to others, there is always a blend, a perfect blend of negative, incident, in negative emphasis or warning about the Holy God's coming judgment uh, for every person and also against all the false teachings that are out there, like we see so predominantly in our, in our postmodern world, there is false teaching everywhere. And the, and the true teaching is getting repressed. And we have to, we have to, that's a negative statement by myself, but we as believers have to be aware of this negativism that's in our world, and we need to move against it, speaking the truth and love at every opportunity. And as this false teaching is being spread around the world, we need to combine our negative statements on it with the positive setting of the significance of Christ Jesus, our one and only Savior and Lord. Some preaching and teaching is predominantly negative in this emphasis. It has to be. We have to speak the truth, and part of that truth is negative. While there is definitely a place for calling or warning people about sinful practices, if it stops at that, it is woefully lacking in the good news of Jesus Christ. The audience to whom we preach or teach is every person, whether they be Jews or whether they be Gentiles or whether they be postmoderns or whether they be older people. This is the good news that we need to bring to everyone in the world. The audience to whom we preach or teach is every person we encounter. Now look at verse 28. 
the content of our preaching and teaching is all wisdom. We seek to present God's wisdom for a life that is full and meaningful. The goal of our preaching and teaching is to present every person is to is to bring every person and help them to mature in Christ. It is our deep concern that converts become informed and that they become spiritually mature so that they can withstand all of this negative negativism and this persecution that will be coming upon us by this postmodern generation in which we live. Verse 29, all said that he would testify, for this purpose I also labor. So you see, in a lot of respects, nothing has really changed from Paul's day 2,000 years ago to today. Evil is actively working against the good news of Jesus Christ in Paul's day as well as in our day. Paul put it even more strongly by adding, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Is God's power mightily working within you? Are you speaking the truth in love at every opportunity? Are you praying to God for strength and words to speak when the opportunity presents itself so that you can speak directly to this individual on a very personal basis? It is, it is God's working powerfully through us that, number one, affects the conversion of unbelief. Each one of us has a direct effect on the conversion of many unbelievers in, in our lives. And number two, enables those converts to mature in Christ. Every one of us has a role in maturing new believers in Jesus Christ. Now let's go to chapter two and let's move where chapter two, it speaks to us about being always concerned for the faithful. We should always be concerned for the faithful, the people in our churches, the people who have just come to know Jesus Christ. Before they go back out into that hostile world, we need to make sure they're mature and they're prepared for what they're going to face. In verse number one, we read in Colossians chapter 2, for, Paul says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf, and for those who are at Laodicea, and for all those who have not personally seen my face. Now, Laodicea is another church that we haven't heard about thus far in the New Testament. Laodicea is a sister city of Colossae. It is probably under 10 miles uh, just to the west of Colossae on the, on the same bank of the Meander River in Asia Minor. So the people of Colossae, they know about probably the church that's there in Laodicea. They're, they know many of the people there. And, and Paul says, I, I, I struggle on your behalf at Colossae. And Paul says, I struggle on your behalf of the people at the church in Laodicea, which they knew. He says, many of those in both of those churches had never seen Paul face to face. And yet Paul is praying for them, earnestly praying for them, seeking and writing in this letter. Probably Paul is, is telling the Colossians here, take the letter to Laodicea as well. Let them 
read my words. Let them be encouraged by my prayers and my concern for them. Now, regarding postmodernism, we each should trust only those who know the Lord and are close to us in the church. We need to filter all we hear about from the postmodern society, all that we hear, all that we hear from the fake news, all that we see on the internet, all the things that we see on and hear on and read on Facebook, all of these things. We need to filter through God's word under the guidance of God's Holy Spirit speaking to us. This is the message Paul is giving to these two churches in Colossae and Laodicea, these brand new churches, just filled with believers who are not yet mature in Christ. And we need to help those who are mature as immature, spiritually immature believers come to talk to us about things that they've heard on the internet, things that they've seen on Facebook, things that I've seen through the fake news. We need to help them to understand where the truth lies in these things that they see and they hear. Here's a map. Uh, I'll show you where these two cities are. Look right over here. Here's Lystrip. That is the city where Timothy was born and raised. Okay, that's also the city where Paul was stoned almost to death a couple of years earlier. Okay, right across here, about 100 miles almost due west of Lystra is Colossae. See Colossae right here? Okay, and then just less than 10 miles away, on the same southern bank of the Meander River is Laodicea. There's another uh, burgeoning church there at Laodicea. These two churches Paul is, is speaking to in this, this letter, the, these two churches at Laodicea and Colossae. Laodicea is mentioned again in the book of Revelation, so that church continued for some time, the book of Revelation is written about 30 years after this letter is written by Paul. And so it's important for us to, to see uh, this truth. Uh, now, the one thing that I, the reason I pointed out Lystra to you, and it's Timothy, we saw as mentioned at the top of this letter as well, Timothy was from Lystra, which is in this same general area. It's possible, very possible that Timothy had visited both Colossae and Laodicea. These people may very possibly know Timothy. And just a few years after this, Timothy is going to come into the larger, much larger church at Ephesus, which you can see is over here on the west coast of Asia Minor. It's a major city, larger than either of these two, Laodicea or Colossae, and he is going to become the pastor at that much larger church. It's very possible that these people have already met Paul. I mean, met Timothy. They haven't met Paul, but they may have met Timothy. So they would, they would probably Timothy has spoken to them about Paul and his respect that he has for Paul, because Paul is the one who led Timothy to faith in Jesus Christ. Now let's come down to verses two and three. Paul says that their hearts, the people in Laodicea, as well as the people in Colossae, may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. 
all wanted these people in the Colossian and Laodicean churches who had never seen him to be encouraged and having been knit together in love, in the love from God. The Greek word for encouraged there is a powerful word. Look at that. Encouraged. I don't have it under, underlined, but encouraged right here. The, the, that Greek word is a military term for an officer speaking to his troops in order to strengthen their morale and their willingness to engage in an impending battle against their enemy. For us, we have a constant spiritual battle that we face, that we face each and every day a spiritual battle that we will be engaged in whether we want to be or not. We cannot avoid it. So we need to be prepared every day for that spiritual battle. Paul's prayer, which our prayers should be also, was that the members of these two churches would be knit together in God's love. And we need to pray for our church and the other churches, people in the other churches that we know that we will all be knit together in God's love. United, we cannot be defeated. The enemy would divide us, but we should not allow ourselves to be divided. Look at verse 2. There's a, there's a word, wealth. Look at that. Wealth right there. See it? Okay. Wealth is not gold. It is not Bitcoin. It is not dollars. True wealth comes only from full assurance of understanding, resulting in true knowledge of God's mystery revealed in his son, Jesus the Christ. See that? God's ministry at his Christ Jesus. That is where we find our wealth in our world today. God's own nature is fully revealed in his son, Jesus the Christ. In fact, in John 14, 9, Christ Jesus had said to his disciples and to all of his disciples of all time, he says, if you have seen me, you have seen God the Father. Jesus represents exactly God the Father. More reason why we should be spending time in the scripture, looking at the sayings of Jesus, understanding Jesus's ministry. He was showing us God's will in the way he lived his life in the day. Verse three, Paul says, in whom, being Christ, Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So we see a summary of everything we've learned here today in this lesson. Jesus Christ is the almighty God and has no need of the arrays of imaginary supernatural beings as espoused by false teachers who prided themselves in possessing hidden knowledge not available to ordinary believers. That is false teaching. Against such heresies, Paul and we should confidently preach and teach to those who trust Christ that they each have available the wisdom needed for a God-pleasing life and the knowledge of God that enriches life. That wisdom 
And that knowledge comes through God's Holy Spirit who is living in us. As we pray to God, he speaks to us. As we open God's word, as we're doing here today, and we read the scriptures, God speaks to us. And he shows us application in these things in the lives in which we live today. Let's pray. Father, we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for speaking to us through your word in these last few minutes. As we open your word today, Lord, you have spoken to us about the world in which we live today. Lord, you have spoken us to us about the truth that you and you alone have in your mind. You have placed that truth now in our hearts. Lord, we ask, we know that we are eager to share that word to others. But Lord, we know that it is not going to be well shared with others, except Lord, that you go with us as we meet those others, as we speak to them these timeless truths that you have revealed to us. Lord, guide us, Lord, as we do that. We ask, Lord, that you would empower us as we do that. We ask, Lord, that you would encourage us as we do that and meet the, the backlash that comes from evil as we speak the truth. That would try, those who would try to cover it up and make us turn away and cower from speaking what we know we must speak. Lord, give us the courage to speak the truth in every opportunity. Lord, give us the words to say, and Lord, prepare the hearts for those, as we know you do, Lord, for those who we will speak to. And Lord, we ask that yours, Lord Jesus, be the glory forever and ever. Amen.